Orlando. Whoops. Oh boy. Um, I lost him. Just, yeah, he just totally disappeared. Um, so I saw him. Yeah. Uh, there he there is. There he is. There he is. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> my, I, my, my Zoom restarted by itself. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen real fast. Okay. okay. And I will get started. Excellent. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Excellent. All right, great. So my name is Orlando Fressi, and I'm a relationship manager with Sprint Captel part of the new T-Mobile. And today we're gonna to talk about restoring communications um, and, and the importance of communications and how we get individual uh, seniors having normal conversations again. So with Spring Captel, it makes communication natural again. A lot of the, t a lot, communication is actually taken for granted nowadays. And it's probably one, something that we take for granted all the time, right? We've all been there before where we've had stressful days and we just beg for five to 10 minutes of silence. Or if you're a parent and your kids have at, are ongoing, asking you questions 24 or seven, or if you're in this, like most of us now, your children are learning from home. You just say to yourself, geez, I just I wish I had five minutes of silence. And what people don't really realize for those a natural, a natural hearing loss that occurs as they age. And it's something that is troublesome because communication is such a natural part to be able to call your loved ones and have conversations and be able to have mm -hmm. uh, a sense of purpose, uh, especially with your loved ones and family, especially during the, our times now where most of us are self-isolating and social distancing. You know, what we have now are just, can we pick up a phone? And if you do pick up the phone, are you able to use it properly? Spring Captel's caption telephone systems are designed um, with seniors in mind. And the way it works is very similar to how caption telephone system, I mean, excuse me, caption TV, the captioning on TV works, where you can hear what you can and read what you miss instead of saying those, oh, can you say that again? Or, you know, I'm sorry, I missed that. You can just read along as you're having that conversation. With Spring, with Spring Captel, we have phones that are designed for all your clients' needs. We have phones that are, our phones primarily are designed to work and feel just like any old landline phone that you've had in the past. So we have phones for individuals that have no internet, if they live in a rural area or they can't simply afford internet, if they have a traditional, if they want something a little more traditional like, a, like what you would see um, as our old phone with the big buttons and, and easy to read dials. For those seniors that might have some vision issues, we have another device in the 880 that has a high resolution screen that helps with helps with seeing those those LCD screens a lot better. Or even maybe you might have somebody that actually um, has been blind for a long time and possibly can uh, read excuse me read Braille. They can actually hook up a Braille keyboard to that 880 phone and be able to follow the captions like that. Or if you want something with a little bit more modern features. Our 2400i is our flagship device that has a lot of the normal bells and whistles that you would normally see in smartphones, such as Bluetooth, um, speaker phones. We can actually program the devices to that individual's audiogram. So that way the phone can, um, we can utilize specific tones that help that individual hearing better uh, if it's provided from us from their medical provider. The phone also has flashing LED lights and the device, all of our devices are amplified to help be able to hear better than just so that way if you're not, if you can read, I mean, excuse me, hear and read at the same time, the amplification helps you pick up those words. It's everything that you love about technology with none of the worries. 
it's a one button assistance. So all devices across the platform, all four of our devices has a big blue button that says customer service on it. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, even during the holidays. Um, the, all, none of our, none of our, when, when, when your clients call into us, it's a US based staff. We do not outsource any of our customer service and it's something immediate. They don't get locked into the automated systems of pressing one now, pressing two um, to get here. They don't follow any type of call tree. It gets them It gets them to the first available operator as soon as possible. And also I'd like to note that if, if for some odd reason that there isn't, that we cannot get um, that problem solved for that individual, if it's something that they just can't figure out, we can, we can dispatch someone to the house to help them with training if they feel comfortable, or we can set up a, a, a voice, a, a FaceTime or a Zoom or some type of video conversation for that individual so they can walk through it. And, and also has all the popular features that most phones have. Voicemail, again, speakerphone, uh, address with photos, up to 100 contact numbers that you can put in there. It's a very simple ordering process. So just so you know, this is a no cost federally funded program. So this is at no cost at all to the to the individual with hearing loss. A couple of things to qualify: they have to be United States resident, they have to be certified uh, with hearing loss by by a professional doctor, uh, um, a doctor, audiologist, social worker, a nurse, um, even a veteran service officer for those who have served, and they need to have a pre-existing phone or internet at their homes. It's a very simple program for individuals like yourself in order to tell your clients about the phones. We have demo phones and marketing material provided to you. So that way you can show the devices to, the, to your clients and let them know what the devices do. There's no inventory or on-site ordering process. That's all handled through us. We have direct support in training for, um, for new staff and clients. So individuals like myself and our other outreach teams are available throughout the United States. And it's a big impact at no cost. Again, we're bridging the gap of communications for those who are who are suffering of hearing loss. Sprint Capital is a program for senior living. Again, we I talked about a little bit earlier about how community talking and, and listening are, are, are things that we take for granted every day because we do them every day, right? And I think we've learned a lesson in 2020 and how much we need that interaction with people. And for those who are experienced hearing loss, even more, even more so now, especially with, with our seniors. It keeps them happy, it keeps them social and engaged, whether it's with their family or with you. It gives them peace of mind. It helps them know that everyone's healthy and safe, especially again, for these trying times. And it sets you apart as an organization for, for your clients and the people that you serve. Uh, it's an added benefit for you to have for someone that's experiencing these type of things. You know, if they come to see you or they're a resident of, of, of your establishment and they say, you find out that they're having issues with hearing or they can't talk to their loved ones. Now you have um, a service that you could provide to them at no cost to them or no cost to yourself. And just a couple just a couple quick things about Sprint Captel. We are part of the new T-Mobile. We lead the industry in, in, in caption telephone services. We were actually the very first provider in the United States to provide caption telephone systems here in the United States. We are certified through the FCC, that's the Federal Communications Commission, because we are funded by them. Uh, all of our devices and services are guaranteed for a lifetime. And we are the most trusted captel caption telephone provider in the United States. We we service we service all 50 states, and we are and and still growing throughout and looking to do and in, be international as well. And that's all for my time. I really appreciate everyone's um, time and, and taking a moment during your break to listen to me. Um, again, my name is Orlando Fressi please take note of my contact information on here. Um, you can contact me by email at orlando.fressi at tmobile.com 
or you can simply call me on my cell phone or shoot me a message if you have any questions or if there's any questions in the queue, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I am copying your uh, contact information on our chat box. Um, and Excellent. we did have a couple uh, uh, quick questions. We have about a minute. Um, sure. So what is your experience with installing phones in uh, living, those living in nursing homes? Are, are you able to do that? Absolutely, we can. Um, it, we do have to have a conversation with that particular um, establishment first, make sure there's not any IT um, barriers or firewalls because we, we try to go in with an uh, internet protocol version first. Um, but that's something that we can discuss with the IT people, but we install in nursing homes all the time. Terrific. Well, again, we do appreciate, um, I think you're going to get some calls. People were asking the cost and if you can attach it to a Bluetooth printer, but we the, are- The um, answer is absolutely no cost whatsoever. And Bluetooth printer, I'd have to double check, but yeah, shoot me those emails if you guys have those questions, absolutely. Okay, we do appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. No, no problem. Thank you for your, thank you for having me. Bye-bye now. Uh, well, we have about two minutes until we are going to pull in our next presenter. Um, we'll give it a, a, another minute or so. We're having some of our folks come on. It looks like Sharon, I mean, um, Betsy and Jennifer for this session. Okay. Talking. Okay. Um, Betsy and Sharon. Uh, is Sharon Canner yeah, still on? She's supposed on to be moderating. So. Okay. So I'll be I'll be on. So I'll just help Betsy moderate, um, and we'll be good to go. Um, are we live? Uh, we are. We are good. Okay. To go. Good. Hey. Introduce a wonderful friend and uh, just uh, somebody I've enjoyed working with over the last next last couple of years, at least four, I think. Uh, Jennifer Hammer, um, I love her bio. She says she's passionate about finding ways to help people stay in their homes, exploring options for affordable housing, and building relationships with communities and companies that support the aging population across the nation. Before she joined Silvernest, Jennifer assisted people overwhelmed by downsizing and moving out of their homes. She, she, that was an incredible experience, I'm sure. She's a former 20 year Navy spouse and ombudsman, a certified teacher and has experience in the mortgage, mortgage industry. Um, Jennifer excels at assembling resources and developing partnerships to creatively solve problems. After her two children left for college, Jennifer began sharing her home with a housemate, giving her a very personal and unique understanding of the benefits and challenges of home sharing. So without further ado, welcome Jennifer. You're on mute. I guess I've been on mute all day. I'm just used to that red button being there. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see you. I'm bummed we can't be in person too, but uh, this is going off really well. Congrats. So thanks for the opportunity. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we'll hope this works. Otherwise, I think we have a backup. Can you guys see that okay? Yes, yes we no? can see it. You got it? Okay, great. Um, I don't know why it's not. Let me see if I, there we go. I there like that go. mode better. Okay, so I, um, yeah, so thank you again um, for letting me be here. We are really excited at Silver Nest because We've really figured out some ways to partner with nonprofits and government entities um, and make things, make home sharing even more simple than it already was before. So just to kind of level set, the spending in this country on Medicare in, uh, re in related to social isolation and loneliness is astronomical and it's just going up. 
maybe one of the only good things, a few good things, but maybe one of the good things out of this whole COVID thing is people are actually paying attention a little bit more to how terrible social isolation and loneliness is. Um, and then millions and millions of Americans are housing cost burdened. And when you say housing cost burdened, the definition of that is you spend 30% or more of your uh, income on housing. Severely cost uh, burdened is 50% or more. So just for some quick overviews. So why is this important? Well, housing is kind of at the center of everything we do, right? I mean, when you don't have secure housing, it's harder to stay healthy. It's harder to be financially stable. It's harder to just be part of a community and have social relationships. I mean, so much of your bandwidth when you don't have stable housing is just trying to find stable housing and it's a terrible place to be. Um, some of the solutions that we have out there, the first one is actually <laughs> Pretty commonplace, unfortunately, it's just inaction. No one's doing anything. There's a lot of talk and studies and scampering around, I feel like, but no one's, more and more people are having a hard time affording housing and nothing's really happening. Um, new construction, I am a huge uh, advocate for affordable housing construction. My sister is, is a developer, um, but it's expensive. It's, it's so expensive to build. Um, it gets caught up in a lot of red tape. A lot of nimbyism happens. It's, you know, it can be three, five, 10 years out from when you start developing. Um, they have, you know, bricks and sticks kind of cost to it. Um, and then there's soft cost and it's just not scalable. Um, the, the, the number of wait lists out there for affordable housing are just growing and some are starting to shut down. I've more and more are shutting down. They're just stopping the wait lists. Um, and so one solution that we that we really believe in is home sharing because it's affordable, um, it's immediate, these rooms exist, and it's very scalable if you do it right. So right now in America, it's estimated there are 44 million empty bedrooms in this country. And that's a lot of bedrooms that people could be either uh, leveraging or staying in as an affordable solution. And um, there's a lot of really great <laughs> benefits for both parties, the, the homeowner and the housemate. So the reason most people start kind of exploring home sharing is quite frankly, income. Um, you know, and on average nationally, uh, people make about $850 a month for every single room they rent in their home. So we found out we have a lot of our users that rent two. Um, I, have, I talked to a woman in Dallas who's renting out five rooms in one of her six bedroom homes. Um, and she loves it. She's now just doing it for other reasons. She just loves building her own golden girls down there. <laughs> so, um, but then what happens, so you kind of, that usually is the impetus for home sharing, but what's happening is that home sharing has really positive effects on your health and well-being. Um, that social interaction means that, you know, maybe someone's checking up on you and that just feels good and you get out of bed in the morning. Um, you can, um, you have someone that maybe if you don't feel good, they can run and get you some medicine. Um, that's, you know, you'll feel better quicker or they can call the doctor or a family member or a friend if it's really serious. Um, and that all helps you stay where you wanna stay, live how you wanna live, it's empowering. Um, and quite frankly, I loved earlier when Pazit was talking and she was saying that you have to interject fun into some of this. I home sharing is fun. It can be really fun. You don't have to have a best friend, but it can be really fun. And when you're having fun and you're having a happier life, um, you tend to be a little healthier. Um, so Silver Nest quickly, just to kind of um, tell you a little bit about our platform. It's a technology platform. It's all online and you can um, find a lot of information there about home sharing. We have blogs, information, um, all kinds of resources. You can search listings. And then if you decide this might be something you wanna explore, you can sign up either as a housemate, so that's someone looking for a room or sign up as a homeowner. So that's somebody who has extra room in their house. Um, and so here's kind of a quick overview of how it works. So if you decide to sign up um, as a homeowner or housemate, you'll start getting matches. Um, usually they'll be in that 75% to 100% match range. And, um, and you'll get a compatibility score based on some profile questions that I'll talk about in just a second. And then you can talk to potential housemates. Uh, you decide if you wanna reach out or not and connect over our, our platform. If you decide you are gonna give this a try and you found somebody that's gonna work out for your timeline, your budget, all those types of things and personality wise, create a state specific lease on our site, a home sharing agreement, um, and there's insurance coverage now and you can automatically pay your rent. And we'll be there 
you know, we're dedicated to being there through the whole process. So from start to finish, when, when you're looking for someone until that lease ends, we're there the entire time. So people always ask kind of, how do you decide, you know, who to pick? Um, you're gonna ask, both parties answer a bunch of questions. Um, and this, this is true of most home sharing programs around the country that tend to be a little bit smaller and it's more pen and paper. Same questions apply here online. Um, do you have preferences around age or gender, um, lifestyle questions? Do you like pets? How do you feel about guns in the house? Smoking, is it okay to just smoke outside? No smoking at all. Um, daily interaction type of things. Do you work from home, which is more common now, obviously. Um, are you, do you travel a lot? Do you, you know, do you like, me, what kind of music do you like? All kinds of things. Um, and then we are also very dedicated to protecting everyone who's on our platform. Um, so just to get on the platform, ID verification, background checks, messaging, and now we have insurance coverage as well. So uh, $10,000 for renters and then $100,000 for the homeowner and there are no application fees or deductibles, it's just included. So the other thing we get asked about all the time is um, what, what happened with you guys in COVID? <laughs> so, um, and we wanted to know too, obviously, Obviously loneliness and social isolation, loss of income. And then there is a lot of moving around in this country right now. People are moving to get out of the city. They might be moving to get closer to families. It, it's, there's just a lot going on. And so what we're seeing is there's a demand for co-living just because people don't ever wanna have stay at home orders again where they don't have anyone. So they're either trying to find somebody to live with or they're moving in with families, but that empty nest and being alone during this pandemic has really wreaked havoc on a lot of our users. Some of their stories were incredible. The loss of income um, obviously is a driver. It always has been. It's more of a driver now and you can pick up any paper and read why um, people are going to need to find new ways to leverage what they have. Um, and then the location that we talked about, it just needs to be more flexible now. Some people maybe want to try moving out of the city. Maybe they, maybe they think they'll come back. They don't know. Um, you know, it, it just needs to be maybe not get, you don't want to get necessarily locked into a 12 month lease and have to move all your furniture. In a home sharing situation, you can find somebody that's maybe willing to let you live somewhere for three or four months, six months, whatever. And this is where you work it out um, and you're empowered to just find what fits the best for you. We also um, have a lot of resources right now um, responding to COVID just around home sharing, how do you feel about masks? Because we know all the, you know, the stuff that goes along with COVID response and reactions to COVID is gonna require us to address that. And so we are very happy to get out in front of things and, and say, hey, let's, let's have this conversation now. How do you feel about guests? How do you feel about masks? How do you feel about cleaning? And those are all questions that we're helping people answer with all of these um, COVID resources that we've um, designed. And finally, this is what super proud of. Um, our tri-sector partner model is a model where we do what we do best, which is we sit back and we scale and we do all of the heavy lifting that is required of a home sharing program. What we don't have is uh, boots on the ground. I don't have lots of, I don't know all the ins and outs of every local government throughout the, the country and every local nonprofit and who does what and how to leverage it to best help people. And that's how our, that's what we've discovered is really successful. Um, and I'll give you an example. HomeShare Oregon, and uh, feel free to go to homeshareoregon.org, is a nonprofit. It's based out of Portland. And they are just using our technology to support all of their nonprofit partnerships. So their main focus is affordable housing and getting people affordable housing or keeping people in, in their homes. And so they use, they use our technology to power all that, but they also do a lot of other stuff. They'll do the, um, make, you know, the downsizing, they'll find resources for you. Um, if you maybe need something, you know, some other type of help along the way that we don't support. So it's this, nice huge umbrella organization. They have partners with Metro Home Share, Ecumenical Ministries, all the local partners out there that we don't have access to or didn't know about. And they, they're basically helping people. Whether, whether helping people means they ended up home sharing or not, they're gonna help people. But anybody that needs to home share, we're gonna 
provide that support. So it's been, I'm super proud of it. Uh, we have another one coming online uh, in Southern California with a council of governments. And then we're working with some other counties uh, here on the East Coast as well to bring these partnerships to life. And it's really, really exciting. So um, if there's anybody that needs more information about any of this, I am really happy to um, talk to anyone figure out what your program does, what it might need, how I can support it, where we can collaborate to help the most people. Um, I think we were talking of um, what it was uh, from New York, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about just how we're not in a silo and we really need to partner to figure out really innovative ways of doing things and to, to not all be doing the same thing individually. So if we can all work on our, you know, work with our strengths, we can really help some people out in a really meaningful way very quickly. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that. So anyway, I'll end with this. This is just people home sharing around the country. These are all real users. We have a ton of, of this on our website. I encourage you to, to give home sharing you know, a consideration. It's really, um, I, well, I'm a personal professional advocate for it. So that's, I'll stop there. Um, and I know I flew through that, but I wanted to make sure if there were any questions, I'm happy to Oh yeah, them. you're not getting away with that fast. Um. <laughs> I, I, well, you know, I figure I'll let people ask what they need to ask. That's usually better. Betsy, why don't you handle the ones in the Q and A and I'll do the ones on the chat. You're on, you're on mute. <laughs> That's the 2020 phrase of the year, right? You're on mute. <laughs> Diane Watson has three really good questions. Okay. How do you go about vetting a potential person who wants to home share with you? Do, do you all do that or is it up to the, between the two people or how does that work? Uh, so how do you find a homeowner? I, I wanna make sure I understand the question. How do you vet the I think do you vet, how oh. do you vet? Do you have background checks? That we have background matter. checks. We have background checks for the homeowner, not for, I'm sorry, for the housemate, the person's looking, but not for the homeowner. And that is actually, I love this because that's one of the reasons these partnerships are working so well, because some of the nonprofits do want additional vetting that we don't, we just, our platform currently doesn't support. So if there's vetting based on income levels, or if there's vetting based on, we want to do a walkthrough beforehand, you know, I just don't have the staffing for that, but a nonprofit now, if they or a government program, if they want to, if they want to say, "Hey, we're going to require that we do a walkthrough," we can certainly support that. So that's that's where this partnership's great. Anything we need to build to make it what that geography or that government or nonprofit needs, we can build. Okay, good answer. Mm -hmm. um, also, she asked, "Do you find adult kids resistant to the idea of strangers moving in with parents?" No, you know, we have, we've actually had more people sign their parents up, help their parents kind of, I think, you know, cause I, I talked to, I have the same, right. I'm 50. My mom is 72. And I think, and I, and I think that mirrors the conversations we're having. I'm like, mom, you should try this. This, I'm not telling you to get married and have someone live in your house for 10 <laughs> years. Try it for six months, you know, just um, give it a shot. See if you like it. And if you don't, it's okay. You know, um, but so we actually have more advocates um, in, in the children than people who are worried about it. And then they're involved in it, right? They know exactly who's moving in because they can be part of this process. And she asked, do you find that people answer the questions honestly? Um, that, <clears throat> you know, on both ends, I suppose. We do. We do. We, um, and we monitor a lot. If there's ever anything, we have a lot of, you know, security measures in place, but we do, if there's ever anyone that looks like they're just sending more messages than is normal or something like that, we'll, we'll dig into that. Um, and, you know, we really encourage families to get involved. This is not something you do kind of, you know, that we're like, oh, you should be really quiet about finding a roommate and home sharing. You know, we encourage, like, tell your family, get them to meet the potential, you know, roommates. Like this is, this is all, you know, very much something you should tell everyone you're doing. Tell your neighbors, tell your kids, tell your, you know, your parents um, and make it a community thing. And then lastly, there's a question, does Silverness work with Section 8 vouchers? I wish we did. I am working to, if I could figure that out, I would love to talk to somebody. Um, we currently, our payment processing is not designed for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just haven't gotten there yet, but I, I would love to figure, I'd love to crack that code. 
Um, and and so I think that's going to take some legislation, quite frankly. Um, I think that'll probably take more than what I can do on just from my side. How many, mm -hmm. how many people have you organized so far uh, <laughs> with home shares? We have four. I have one live, two going, well, one going live this month. The next one's in the pipe, and I think it should be Q4 this year. And then I have another one in early 2021. So there's four. So, but you've had past ones too. The total number you've had past, not not the not the public private partnership. Okay. This is the oh, first, this is uh, just a yeah. Yeah, okay. this is kind of how we're doing the nonprofit. Now there's partners all over the country, yes, oh. that have you know tried to do this, but I think this is really the way to mm -hmm. do this successfully. Um, so, so yeah. Chris Kennedy also asked. She's with Age to Age and and a member of Lancaster Downtowners. She said, are you familiar with the HIP housing in San Mateo? Um, do you know that at all? Uh, you know, I have run across it just because there's another HIP housing I'm working with, but, um, well, <laughs> but I, so I've only heard of it in passing. Not well, I'll hook you up with Chris and, That'd be great. and answer that. That's okay. great. Um, and a couple, oh, this one I really liked. Um, several people asked this. Um, um, do you see many college or grad school students uh, interested in home sharing? We do, we do. And I am gonna make a little plug. One of the other partnerships I'm hoping to have come online. I, I did a pilot, we did a pilot last year um, in 2019 on a very small scale with um, AmeriCorps and Teach for America and had some really great stories and learnings coming out of that. We, we did learn a lot, but um, I think that's gonna be much bigger in 2021. Um, probably not quite nationwide, maybe if, you know, uh, quite a few states are going to hop on, but grad students, AmeriCorps, um, all kinds of opportunities to really just, you know, help people that are trying to struggle through school or do a year of service, all that. And, and they just need housing for, you know, anywhere from nine to 12 months. So it's a really, I, I love that. And I should say on our platform too, you can um, indicate, hey, um, I will consider reducing the rent in exchange for um, help around the house. Nothing medical or personal, but mowing the lawn, running some errands, things like that. So that's, if you find somebody who maybe their budget isn't quite what you were hoping, um, you can negotiate that if it's the right fit. And I would encourage that a lot of people do. Um, good question. And, and I know you can answer this. Is Silver Nest available everywhere? It is. We um, are available nationwide. We have stronger markets right now, but um, we're scalable. We've had listings in all 50 states. I'm not going to promise you you're going to find anything in the middle of, you know, probably Nebraska right now, but um, is there, but it is scalable. Is it? Is there a minimum age? Um, 18. Okay. You need to be an adult. And do you do groups or families? So the way the the way the platform is set up right now, it only supports individuals, but I mean, a homeowner, a lot of our homeowners say my husband and I, so someone will build the, build the profile and they'll say my husband and I live here, or, you know, I'm here with my two children or whatever the situation is, but you kind of just take the one profile and then you can build out, you know, you can say there's a lot of room to talk about yourself. And so you can say it's, it's actually my husband and I, or my partner, or whomever lives in the house or needs housing. Um, Chris again asked um, the Silver Nest fee structure, how does it work? Is there a revenue stream that flows into the public private partners? Um, that is, so it's changed a little. And I don't even know if I've talked with you. We've been kind of busy since you've been planning this. So, so me? So oh, no, I haven't yes. even talked to you. <laughs> I know, I need to give you and some I updates. haven't even been to Chadwick. So I know, like, I'm we done. To... <laughs> I know. I, I know. Um, you so... know what? You will, uh, if you can get me some of this information, I will, um, I will publish it on the, yes. the forums um, as a follow-up. Yeah, um, obviously, this is very new. Um, one other question is, um, we have about, yeah, we have a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, do you get pushback from local governments? You know, no, I am, there's a couple that are a little, still a little harder to convince, I guess, that home sharing is not Airbnb because it's not. Um, I'm not competing with hotels. I'm not, you know, I'm just not in an Airbnb space. We, we vet people, we match them. The minimum you can um, do this is a month, but most of our leases are bumping up against a year. It's really people who want to live in a community, be part of a community, build that community. And, and you know, and these become real relationships and it's home sharing. Um, 
we don't support at all anyone renting out empty homes or, or th you know, things like that. That's why we ask all those questions. And I will put a plug in. I'm really excited. Uh, DC um, has a senior co-living bill that's on the docket this month for public hearing. So um, I encourage anyone to check it out. I'll be testifying. Um, I'll be giving some supportive testimony to DC senior co-living bill. Um, we also submitted testimony and it was passed unanimously here in Oregon. Oregon now authorizes up to a $300,000 property tax abatement for people who home share. So it's pretty significant. Now it's county by county, they can make that decision, but it is authorized. So there's some really powerful, good legislation happening around home sharing because people are recognizing that it's a real solution. Um, one other question was um, from Linda Fox. She wanted to know if you can expand on how you can help. And this came up in the last segment too about technology and how helping you you touched on it can you touch on that a little bit yeah well and this is again this is where <laughs> you know i'd love to roll this out with some villages or something too or you know I, somebody was talking i think it was the ags was talking about the technology they were. support yeah. yes so i can't i don't have that i can't sit next to someone so let's say for example you know you have a you have a tech, you have a technology center that helps seniors with technology and you can sit next to somebody that just or even anybody it doesn't have to be seniors right <laughs> I, I get my I'm, i get my son to help me all the time um to just help you do some stuff online or maybe take some pictures and upload them or you know if there's just some supportive way that a nonprofit can help with that higher concierge piece of this, that's what I need. Cause I can't do that. I don't have that. And I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. I will bounce ideas around all day. This is, we can figure this stuff out. We can figure out how to make, how to get people in affordable housing, you know, preserve affordable housing, let people have more options to stay and live where they want to live and, and, and just work near their work. So they don't necessarily have to travel for an hour and a half because they can't afford to live close to where they work. All of these things, like we can figure this out. It just takes some discussions and some partnerships and some, you know, new ways of looking at things. So I'm, I'm ready. Anyone that wants to talk, I'll talk. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind going into the chat room and do to the everybody, to all the panel and the oh, sure. uh, attendees, contact information in there and mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the website, um information that would be awesome um, that I, in right now. I think we are running out of time when well, we have about two minutes we have any other yeah. questions betsy i know i'm bumping up against the end of the thing so i'm not i promise i won't run over it's all right no, no. <laughs> um i think the only thing that i didn't cover was um just cost um so right now it's we until we do our job it used to be a subscription um, model for those of you who are familiar with it prior this month we moved to a, it's a five percent service fee and you don't pay anything until you are completely matched so and that five percent fee covers and it's just five percent of the rent and it covers the insurance it covers all of the auto rent payments, everything, and nothing is um, charged until you are completely through. Like you've found someone, you know, you've signed a lease, all of those types of things. So we have to do our job before you, before it charges at all. Yeah, and actually I did miss one, um, which I thought was is interesting too. So I wonder if, and we, we had this back at my old village, um, you have somebody that may move in as a, you know, roommate, whatever, and all of a sudden they need more care. What mm -hmm. happens? Have you faced that? So yeah, and, and you know, normally people just work it out because they've lived together and they know each other and they figure something out, right? And and but if it needs to get more technical, there's a 30 day because we've had we, you know, we've had a homeowner that has died. Um, he had a roommate and the homeowner died, and so there was a you know, a 30 days, but they ended up it was still everyone works with each other. This is why it's so great because it becomes so much less transactional when you get to know somebody that you're living with. You know, you 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 become friends. You build a community mm -hmm. of your own, and so we have not had to intercede in any of those. People have oh, worked. That's good. Yeah, it's kind of kind of great. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. We thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, all your time. Um, great presentation. A lot of chatter. I think we might have to have we might have to have a webinar on this. <laughs> well, you know me. I'll I'll hop on you know live. I know. Whatever. You just let me know. know. No, no Steve is, Steve is going to do it next on one of his little chat rooms. Yes. Oh, we've so, already I know. been talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I love the village. I really, I just so support this movement at every level, local to national. It's just, I, you know, I love you guys. So thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you for jumping on. We appreciate it. Um, and Steve, I think we have to get D Dick Elkin moved over also. Okay. All righty. Uh, hold on. Okay. Okay, not seeing him. Oh, there he is, Richard. Got to yep. go by people's last names, yeah. All right. Okay, Richard. Oh, and Patty Brinkman, can you take her off? Uh, Hi, Dick. Hello. I'm going to let you have the privilege of introducing Dan. I'm going to spin the wings. So, and I'll come back on at the end of your presentation, Dan. So. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Well, I'm happy to introduce Dan Ehrman. Dan has been associated with the Village to Village Network since 2009, when we first let out an RFP asking for a some software that would help people run villages. And I guess since 2010, it's been operating. Um, my village has been using it for nearly that long. <clears throat> Dan has been to all of these national village gatherings. I think he's about one of the few, let's put it that way. I'm not sure if he's the only one, but one of the few. So with that, he, his long association with the network, let me turn it and over to Dan. Dick, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. It, it is a real pleasure um, to be here. I, I think at the last conference, which was actually in Chicago, um, it turned out there were two of us who have been to every single, uh, every single conference. And uh, so it's certainly my pleasure and my honor uh, to be participating with you today. I'm going to uh, share my screen and... <clears throat> Let's move over to a slideshow. So I'm the um, founder and CEO, well, co-founder and CEO of Club Express and specifically the Run My Village um, platform that runs um, on Club Express. And what we're gonna talk about today is sort of a village 101. And I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about Run My Village. I'll be jumping over and showing you different features as I go along. Um, but what I want to talk about is managing the village front office and back office um, using, um, using Run My Village and, you know, all of the things that you need to think of as you're um, working uh, with a village, um, you know, those of you that are looking to set up a village and, um, and, you know, run all of the different aspects. And hopefully I can show you that you can do most of them um, using our platform. So let's go here. And um, just a little bit of background. Um, Club Express was uh, founded in 2003. Um, we launched in 2004. Um, and we run thousands of clubs and associations. We're really a platform designed for membership-based organizations. Um, <clears throat> as Dick mentioned, we started working with the Village to Village Network in 2009, originally um, uh, working on the, the network website. And it wasn't until a year or a couple of years later that they said, could we use Club Express to actually run villages? And so we put together a gap analysis and we worked out all of the features that villages would need in order to, you know, to manage services, service providers, service requests, things like that. We added that functionality um, and we're actually a formal partner with the Village to Village Network, which means that in order to use the village functionality within Club Express, you need to be a member of the Village to Village Network. Um, but in return for that, you know, we provide unlimited support, we provide discounts, um, and you know, what it costs to run Club Express for your village will, will really amaze you. 
Um, it's been enhanced many times over the years. And we also work very closely um, with the Run My Village um, users group, which runs within the Village to Village network. Um, Dick Elkin is one of the leaders of that group, David Chosiad and, and others as well. And more villages run on Club Express than on any other platform. So <clears throat> when we talk about the village front office, we're really talking about how do you communicate the, the mission of your village? What is the brand that you want to protect? Um, who are the customers? What is the area that you serve? What kind of services do you want to provide to members? What fees do you charge and how do you charge it? Um, you want to help people who want to volunteer to do so, and you want to get contractors, you know, connected up um, as well. So these are all of the things that you do to communicate to potential members, um, to volunteers, to the public, um, the community, obviously public service agencies, local and state government as well, to communicate, you know, the mission and brand of your village and what you can really do to support and strengthen your local community. Now the back office is um, everybody that you deal with and how, how do you manage them? It's the members, prospective members, volunteers. I'm, I'm not gonna run through the whole list. You can see all of those different things, the services that the village provides and how do you charge and manage dues and uh, donations? How do you track accounting and the website itself? And how do you communicate um, with the community? So Run My Village can certainly help you to do both of those, let's switch over. I'm actually, I'll tell you what, let's log out here. I'm logged in already. So what we have here is a, a demo village that's built on the Run My Village platform. And we give you all of the tools necessary to build and maintain the website, to create content on the website and manage that content um, about the village. You can control the look and feel, all of those sorts of um, features, uh, you know, links to make donations, and you can have different funds into which people make um, donations. You can also allow members to sign up um, through the, the website so that they can become members of the village. And you can also allow people to sign up as a contractor or as a volunteer by collecting their basic information. Now, every member and um, staff person or administrator also has their own login. And when we log in, we move to the second part of the website, which is the part that you have for members only. So the system knows that I've logged in as Martin Smith. Um, Martin actually owes money. So there's a dollar icon there and you can see there's a payment due. Um, but then now we're on a second part of the website, which allows um, members to see what's going on for members to request um, services. And as an administrator, um, it also allows you to manage all of the backend stuff. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. So what you need is a database to help you manage all of the contact information for members, including their additional contacts, their emergency contact information. Um, you're probably gonna have multiple membership types they each have an a duration, an expiration date. It could be an individual member or a household member. Um, and you're also going to want to ask questions that are unique um, to your village. Um, and in some cases, you also want to tr track every single contact you have with those members and the history of their transactions and payments and their service requests. So the way we do that in Run My Village, as an administrator, um, and we have multiple levels of security, um, by the way. But as an administrator, I can go to the administrative control panel and I can go to the people manager. This is a, a, a function that we recently updated. I can search for all of my members. And so for example, for Cindy Allison, I can jump in and look at Cindy's profile, look at her contact information and update and manage all of that. So here's the general information that we're collecting. Um, primary address, optionally, if you want a secondary address. Um, and even emergency contact information. So all of that's available and built in. We can also track additional member data. So we might have some special instructions. Um, 
uh, if you you might be a hub and spoke village, so you want to know what community um, uh, uh, Cindy lives in, and you can have as many questions as you need here, where you're asking questions that are you know important to your village, and essentially you're expanding the database. Um, we also obviously maintain a complete history of all transactions, payments, events. Um, some of your members may also be volunteering and we can keep a complete history of volunteering. Um, so, you know, all of that information is already built into the platform and you simply enable it, you configure it and you use it. Um, now, before I go on, I also uh, just wanted to take an aside and introduce um, Samantha Horia. Um, Samantha's also on the call. She's one of our, um, uh, the people that's part of our customer success team. And if you have questions as I'm going along, please do type, type them into the um, chat window and then Samantha will be monitoring that and answering them. And we'll, we'll certainly have some time for um, other questions uh, towards the end as well. Okay. You also have prospective members and you want to track all of the information about prospective members. How do they hear about the village? Um, perhaps do an intake survey and ultimately convert them to members. And that's also something that we can do. In addition to that, you're tracking your volunteers. So the volunteers are, are the people that provide the services. Um, you could have member and non-member volunteers. They need to go through a vetting process, especially if they're providing um, transportation services. You need to check all of their driving information and insurance. And you need to match up volunteers with the services that they can provide and also when they're available. And the way we do that within Run My Village is, let me go back to the control panel. And here is this services tab that allows you to track um, everything related to village services. And we go down here and we look at service providers. Now there are three different types of service providers built into the platform. You've got contractors, members who volunteer and non-members who volunteer. And if I do a search, I get a list of those. So I could look, for example, at Joseph Aguilar and collect all of his basic contact information. But I also want to see what services Joseph can provide. And so we, here are the services that the village has defined. And we'll look at how that list is defined in a moment. And maybe Joseph is able to provide grocery trips, medical trips, and friendly visiting, but he certainly can't provide um, plumbing services because Joseph's not a plumber or an electrician or whatever. Um, so the important point is you wanna track all of your service providers, and then you want to link them up with the services that they can provide. So when a member needs someone to take them to a grocery trip, um, you want Joseph potentially to be one of those people that is, is shown in that list. Um, you can also specify, uh, you can view their complete history um, and you can also check their availability. So we have a really fun screen here, which allows you to match members up to what days they're available, uh, what times of the day they're available and are they most likely available? Are they a backup? Might be available and then call me if really desperate um, is one of the options here as well. And there's another screen which I won't show you that allows volunteers and, and admins to track vacation time. So if some of your volunteers are college students and they're away, uh, well, you know, with the pandemic, they might not be on campus anyway, but you know, if they're away during summer vacation, well, then they're not available. Um, you know, for that whole um, period of time. Okay. And of course we have contractors as well. Generally contractors provide services to members where the member has, has to actually pay, a gardener, a roofer, an electrician, a plumber. They should also go through an application process. They should also go through a vetting process. And again, you want to link them up to the services that they provide. And you need to be able to record what kind of discounts they provide to members. And that's done using the same screens that I just showed you. Um, most villages also need to keep in contact with a lot of other people. Um, everyone who needs to know what's going on in the village who's not a service provider and they're not a member. 
So it could be press, government officials, um, public safety, social welfare agencies. Um, and you also want to categorize and organize them and keep in, in, in contact with them. And the way we handle that within Run My Village is we go back to this people manager function and the people manager allows you to track members or non-members as well. And we could also filter our non-members by, uh, let me scroll down a little ways here, um, by category. So you can create whatever categories you want. The system also includes a number of categories. So for example, if I check press and click search, uh, I get zero, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what other categories we have. Um, we can look at non-member volunteers as well. And I can search and I could find all of those people um, also. So the point is we've got this one screen here that allows you to find all of those people to organize them into different categories. Perhaps John Beck, in addition to being um, a non-member volunteer, also happens to be a member of the press. And so it's very easy to organize and to categorize people uh, in different ways and to keep track of them. And then of course, to send them last emails. And, and you, know, you can also send a single email. I can also click on uh, this icon here and get all of their contact information um, immediately at hand. Okay, so every village needs to decide what services it's going to provide. We have some villages running on the Run My Village platform that have over a hundred different services. Um, <clears throat> and so in addition to the services, you also organize them into categories. And then of course you link them up to the volunteers and contractors who provide those services. Now, the way that's done in Run My Village is we go to the control panel and services. And we start out here by clicking on services and then managing categories. So here are the different categories that, that you could create. One of those, for example, is transportation. And you know, we recognize many villages have um, you know, 80% of what they do is transportation, but you might also be providing technology help. So you can certainly add categories or you can edit existing categories and the categories are all color coded. So when we get to the services manager, you, you get familiar with those ca um, color coding categories very quickly. And these are all very simple forms. Um, you know, a lot of these forms in Club Express, you'll see a, 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 in Run My Village, um, you'll see a, a standard grid like this, and then you'll see a pop-up form that allows you to configure all of this information um, you know, quickly and easily. Now, once you've defined categories, let's filter, for example, under technology help and click search. And you can see very easily how you could, you, you could quickly get to a, a hundred different services. Because even within technology, uh, you, you have members who might need help with Facebook, with Instagram or with a Mac or a PC or a mobile device or Skype so they can talk to their grandkids. I suppose we should add Zoom to this list as well. What the heck, let's uh, add a service. We're gonna have um, Zoom help and the category is technology and it's visible and can volunteers sign up? Um, yes, they can. No special instructions done and we've added Zoom to the technology category. Um, so, you know, here is where uh, you, you define and organize those services. And then once we get back to the service providers, that's when we link them up to the services and we looked at that a little bit earlier. Okay. So service requests. The nuts and bolts of what a village does is manage service requests. So members will call, they'll email or they'll go online to their profile and submit a request online. And at that point, it's up to the village then to manage that request. And we give you a whole bunch of tools that are available to manage that request. For contractors, you might simply refer the member to um, two or three contractors who've been vetted. 
or members can actually look them up themselves. Um, for volunteering services, we give you a number of different ways that you can um, match volunteers up. Uh, we also have ways where you can allow volunteers to log into the website, see the open service requests and sign them up. Um, we call that the pull model. We're pulling them in so that they can sign up. And we also have a push model um, where you can send out emails to all of your volunteers on a regular schedule and allow them to see what open service requests there are and to sign them up. So let's have a quick look at how that all works. Um, this very first option on the control panel says member services. And I go into a screen here that allows me to see all of the different kinds of services and I can filter them in a ton of different ways by request type, by category, status. You can see lots of different status values here. Um, here are the different categories and they're all color coded as we saw earlier. Um, if you're a hub and spoke village, we support that using a concept called metro areas. And then you can filter by dates in different ways. If I simply click search, I see a list of existing service requests. Um, <clears throat> so here is one um, from uh, September the 23rd and it's color coded um, white on green, which is a home wellness visit. I can edit that service request. And here I see a whole bunch of information about the request. Um, it was Albert Finney, here's when it was created. Here is the requested date. Is the date and time flexible? Is the request high priority? Um, what category is it? And then once we've selected the category, we then select the service. And then typically what you can do is that you can, if you're as a village, if you're working the request, you might have a, a member services a volunteer or coordinator, um, you can actually click on add service provider. And now we're looking for members who do home wellness visits, I'm sorry, volunteers, and who are available on this date, um, which happens to be uh, a Wednesday, I think. So if I click add service providers, the system immediately gives me a list of three service providers who are most likely available who provide that service. I could also check backup and call me if really desperate and I might actually see more people on the list. I can check a couple of those people off and now they get added to the list and now I have different options for contacting them and managing the service request. Um, I called them, I left a message, they're not available, they are available. Yes, we've selected them and then we can set everybody else to not needed and send them an email saying thanks, but we've found someone to handle this um, service request. I can also view ratings and history and you know, check availability. So lots and lots of different options here. Um, special instructions, and then there's you know, ways of managing the status and which staff person is responsible um, and things like that. Now, the platform actually supports four different kinds of you know, general types of services. You've got transportation requests and there could be um, within transportation requests, um, lots of information that you wanna collect. The category is transportation, but you could have airport trips, grocery trips, medical trips, family trips, all sorts of things like that. And lots of information you need to collect, including possibly pickup appointment, return pickup and drop off. When we get to a member home request, that's a little bit simpler. And so we have different types of home requests that are not transportation. And you see we're collecting a little bit less information and only two times are potentially necessary. When we look at contractor referrals, those are even simpler. Um, here are the categories that are defined as contractor referrals. They might be indoor home services, and then we can select, um, you know, plumber, house cleaning, changing batteries on a smoke detector, for example. And we can find service providers and then simply send the info to the member. 
it's not something that needs to be managed where we need to manage the time. The contractor and the member will generally work together on that one. And then the simplest type of service request is an office time request, because there are many villages that actually use members to help in the office, stuffing envelopes and doing follow up phone calls and things like that. And so the platform allows you to configure office time requests, and these are even simpler. You know, here's the date that you requested, let's find some members and see if they're available to come into the office, say for two or three hours or half a day to help with different tasks that we might give them. Now there's also a number of other tools that are built in here. Um, you can see in this case, there are no service required, uh, providers requested, but you can see all of the details of the service request. It's for Albert Finney, it's a home wellness visit. Here's the date and time, and when it was created and last modified. Um, in this case, we can mark this one as completed. We could cancel it. We could actually delete it if we want. Or in some cases, we could um, make copies of that service request. You know, sometimes you have members who need to visit the doctor maybe once a week for, uh, or, or every two or three days for dialysis or something like that. And so you could create a service request and then make individual copies, um, make repeating copies, and there's tons of options here, or even make copies without a date. So let's make you know, five copies and then we'll work with the member to, uh, to uh, you know, and a volunteer to schedule all of those copies. So the idea is to give you as many tools as you need um, in order to manage you know, the, the service requests. So everyone hopes that their village will be, you know, will get large and, and successful. And the idea is um, that we want to give you the tools that will really manage, um, you know, potentially hundreds of service requests every month. Uh, we have villages that run 100, 150 requests a week, you know, very easily. And so you need some powerful tools that will help you manage that. Okay. <clears throat> now, Run My Village also allows you to manage the different member types that your village offers. Um, will they be individuals or households? Um, one year duration. Some villages have um, special hidden discounts for lower income residents or residents who might be going through some financial difficulties. Um, you want the platform to notify your members when it's time to renew and allow them to renew online. Um, you want them to pay online um, and credit card processing is included with Run My Village. Um, and you want to make sure, of course, that those transactions are secure. And certainly they are. And of course, you want to track all of the payments and receipts. And those of you that, that uh, are doing full accounting, um, you know, perhaps using QuickBooks or QuickBooks Online, um, you, you would want integration um, with your accounting system. And with Run My Village, of course, we provide all of that. So we go to the administrative control panel and we can scroll down and look at member types. And here's where you can define all of the member types that you need, um, the dues that go with them, the duration, the availability. Um, you could have monthly types. You can have special types that are visible to admins only. So there's a special discount that's available here. Um, and, you know, creating new types or editing existing types is very easy. It's another one of these standard forms. All of the details are there. Um, you just configure the different options that you need, specify the fees and save. And the other thing that's important with Run My Village is that every one of these screens has very uh, um, context sensitive online help. Um, you can also print out manuals for those of you that want uh, you know, a document you can actually hold. And we also have, I think at last count, over 200 video tutorials and webinars. So if I click on um, watch videos, it will take you to our YouTube channel and you can see all of the videos that have something to do with members and memberships. Um, and 
uh, you know, many of these uh, videos um, uh, were, you know, some of them were, are actual formal, whoops, sorry about that. Some of these are actual formal um, uh, tutorials that we've created, and many of them are also webinars that we presented. We, we do, you know, two or three webinars every month um, that we present and we record and edit and then make them available. It's also very easy for you to configure how members will renew and how their memberships will expire. Um, most villages will do rolling renewals based on the anniversary of the join date. And then you configure how you want the renewal notices to be sent out and when you want them sent out. And then you configure the expiration information, you know, how the system will handle membership expirations. And once you do that, um, the system then handles renewals and expirations for you automatically. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a lot of villages offer events, either social events or education events for their members. You might also have marketing events. Um, so Run My Village also includes a very powerful event calendar um, that allows you to create events, publicize them to your members and to the, the general community, prospective members. Um, events might be things like shopping trips to the local mall or, or you know, casino trips for those members that want to do the slots. And, um, and of course, you're also tracking internal events, um, board and committee meetings things like that um, would be nice. And of course we do have a function that allows you to track donors and collect donations. Um, we have a very nice donations module that's built in. Um, I showed it to you briefly um, a, a moment ago. Um, you can set up multiple funds, allow people to make donations. Um, you can even do recurring donations. And of course that all ties in with transactions and payments and accounting. Uh, we have functions that allow you to track um, uh, your committees and to manage committee discussions, email communications within committees and document sharing within committees. So certainly you'll have a board of directors. Um, some of you might also have a planning committee, a subcommittee or a finance subcommittee or a committee that helps to manage volunteers and service requests as well. Um, certainly every village is going to need an extensive set of reports um, and you can see all of the different kinds of things that you'll want to run reports on. Um, <clears throat> we have, I think at last count, more than 400 reports and about 50 data exports built into um, Run My Village. So you can really, you know, extract the data that you need. Um, we also interface with a very powerful ad hoc reporting function um, that allows you to create your own reports and your own charts and dashboards and things. But that one does carry an additional annual fee because it's, it's really a very powerful business intelligence um, software program that we licensed. And I, I should mention, of course, that if anybody who's listening in, you know, those of you that are um, a new villagers in formation, if you want to learn more about Run My Village, um, please, you know, do call our office. Um, we have a, a, a customer account team um, and there are folks there who'll be very happy to chat with you, to give you demos, show you pricing, all of those sorts of things. Um, we also have a 60 day free trial program where you can set up a, um, um, you know, a trial village, build it out, get familiar um, with, you know, all of the features that we provide. Um, you know, there's a bunch of accounting support built in. So I won't go into that. Um, and, and obviously, you know, if you're running your website, both the public side of the website and the member side, you need very powerful tools to manage the website. So every village needs to understand who's going to maintain the website, how will content be added to the website. You might have documents, photos, text, who's responsible for updating the different pages and making it look nice. And, um, and also, as I said, updating it on a regular basis. <clears throat> and certainly we provide the tools to do that as well. I won't go into those um, in great detail, uh, but for example, if I look at 
this page that says uh, about the village, I could edit that page and it's going to take us in to the um, versions manager. So you can have multiple versions of a page. And if I then click the edit link, um, it takes us to um, our new you know, page design tool. We actually deployed this about a week and a half or two weeks ago. Um, very, very uh, new, incredibly powerful, um, and really allows you to um, you know, build out the page in lots of different ways. Um, so you might have an image and some text, and I can build that over here. Oops, it popped up down there. Um, and I can uh, build that over here, and then I can customize the image, select that, change the image, customize it lots of different ways. I can select the placeholder text and edit that as well. Um, so we really give you some very powerful features to manage um, you know, the look and feel of the website and to manage the content of the website, um, the home page and regular web pages as well. Okay, so communications, very, very important nowadays. Um, you want to have regular email communications with your members um, about upcoming events and the services that the village provides. You want to communicate with prospective members about um, um, you know, events, upcoming events where they might you know, learn more about the village, or maybe you bring in a guest speaker uh, to talk about social security or, or, or safety, um, you know, spam and, and scams. Um, uh, you want to communicate with volunteers and contractors and with the local community as well. Um, a lot of villages have a regular schedule of e-newsletters. And so um, you know, it's important to build a template and then have the, the president or the, you know, one of your community people send out those e-newsletters um, e on a regular basis. Now, the way we handle that in Run My Village, let me just close this guy out. Is I go back to the control panel and I go to the communications tab and here is our emailing function. And let's just click search. I'm sure we have an email sitting around somewhere. Here we are, we have a, a draft email. Let's go down to this one because it's got some people assigned to it already. Okay, so here's where you specify the basic information about the email. What's the subject? When do you want to send it? Who it's coming from? Here is where you can specify a complex distribution list. So we have lots of different ways that you can build a distribution list for who the email will go to. And we'll all automatically manage duplicates and bad emailings, uh, bad email addresses uh, uh, as well. We can also, um, we're also fully compliant with the CAN Spam Act. So people have the ability to opt out of receiving emails. And um, so all of that's you know, fully compliant. And then here is where you build the email. And it's a very similar interface to the one that we looked at earlier. I can take um, content and drag that into place. And then I can edit it, specify the content. You know, I could select a template and drag the whole template over. And then I can you know, customize individual elements, for example. And I can do that over here. So the idea is that you can build a very nicely formatted um, email that people will be able to view on their computers or on their smartphones, specify all the content. And then I can save as I'm going along. I can save it as a draft. I can save it as a template. I can send tests. And then if I click ready for delivery, then it's ready to be sent either immediately or on some future date that you've, uh, that you've designated. Um, so again, we give you the tools that allow you to communicate very effectively with your members, with non-members, the general community as well. Now, security is obviously very important. You're keeping a lot of information about your members. Um, and so you want to make sure that, that Run My Village is secure and will protect your data. Um, so we run everything in a secure session. Um, and um, <clears throat> staff, you know, every member and every staff person 
has their own unique login and we can track all of those logins. Um, volunteers also have the ability to log in um, and um, either select service requests that they'll follow up with um, or, uh, or, you know, in some cases to update their, their, um, you know, their availability, uh, things like that. Um, board members will have logins. Um, you want to ensure that, that there is security for credit card processing and Run My Village is fully PC, uh, PCI compliant, the payment card industry. Um, we want to be ensured that there's hardware and software security, and certainly um, um, that we're doing backups and protecting the integrity of your data. We've been doing this now for um, more than 16 years uh, with Club Express and with Run My Village. We have never had a security breach, and we really, um, you know, we really found ourselves to be, you know, on the cutting edge and ensuring the highest level of security for your data. And of course, uh, you know, for credit card um, processing as well. <clears throat> so um, I ran through stuff very, very quickly, um, you know, to give people a sense of the sort of things, you know, again, if you're a village in formation, to give you an idea about some of the things that you want to be thinking about. Um, I, I can certainly make this slideshow available um, uh, as part of the, the materials after the fact, if anyone's interested in, uh, in downloading it and um, um, give you a flavor for how, you know, Run My Village works. We looked at a few screens, um, you know, fairly quickly. Um, and again, if anybody wants to see a more comprehensive demo, um, you know, just call the office and, uh, and we can, um, and, you know, we can schedule that for you. So I wanted to make sure we had lots of time um, for questions. And um, um, I hope that those of you that have been posting questions in the chat, uh, um, that Sam has been, has been answering those. So um, I don't know if Sam or Steve or Barbara, if, if, if we have some general questions that I, that I should answer for everyone, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, one of the things that a couple of people had asked about was taking a look at the calendar and the membership directory just to kind of see what those look like. Okay, sure. And, and Sam, for the next thing, if you could speak up a little bit, please, or turn up your microphone volume. Um, so the question was, could we have a quick look at the event calendar and also the member directory? So where's my mask on? There it is. So if I click on the calendar, um, we bring up the calendar, it's available in grid view or in list view. I can switch over to list view and you'll see a, a list of events here. Let's go back and I can select different months and, uh, you know, and things like that. Let's go back to grid view. What we're looking at is a fake village. It's a demo village that we've created. Um, so we don't have any events here. Let's go back a couple of months and you can see a number of different events. So we have a, a Zoom social event here and it's you know, color coded a certain way. Let's check this legend. This is a get together of color. Um, we have a dinner here and that's in a different color. That's a, a social event. So for each of these events, we can click and it will um, take us to a screen where we can see a detailed description and you have the ability to, of course, format that description. You can see the details of the event Registration is required. There's no fee. Now we see the register now button because we're logged in as Martin, who's an administrator. Um, this event is in the past. So maybe the day after Martin is actually recording those people who, who simply showed up. Um, but you know, normally the register now button would only appear if the event is in the future. Obviously we have the ability to add it to the calendar um, as well. And the way the event calendar works, it's like a lot of these modules that are built into Club Express. It has a user side, which could be the public, or it could be members only, um, but it also has an admin side. And the event calendar is one of the most powerful modules in um, Run My Village in Club Express. So there are admin options at the event level, but also at the module level. So if I click on admin options, I go over to a series of screens that allows me to configure all of the different aspects of the event 
And this is only about half of the screens that are available because this is a fairly simple event. I could actually go to basic info and enable all sorts of other options down here. And, um, you know, the, well, I, I will mention one thing. Those of you that have attended previous um, village to village network um, annual conventions, those are run on this event calendar. So we have the ability for you to build an event which actually, um, uh, which can actually handle a three day conference or something as simple as a, as a Zoom luncheon. Um, the event calendar also has um, an event manager, which allows you to manage, you know, everything about the event itself. So we can search for events and then drill into those events and we can configure event categories and event specific questions, um, standard locations, all of those are, are sort of provided as well. And when we go back to the event calendar, um, you can see that we've got um, search functions here, hide and search those. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's really a very, very powerful um, calendar. And we actually have a developer working about half of his time on adding features and um, making it more powerful uh, and easier to use as well. Now, the other question was about the membership directory. So this is one of the standard modules that's built into Club Express. And I'll just click search. Um, and in this case, and again, this is a demo village, so it's not really um, realistic data, but I could click on Chicago here and I can see information about uh, a number of members who are um, in the Chicago area in, in our village. In this case, there are three members. Let's click on Nick Hamilton. And it takes me down to see Nick Hamilton. And if, you know, members can control what information they show in the directory. So a member might, might say, you know, don't show anything, just show my name. Or the member might say, show my address, my email address, my phone number. You know, I'm happy to, to share with other members. So members can control all of that information. And then down here, we have what we call these biz cards, which allow you to see all of the details and members can have different visibility as I, you know, as you can see in the directory. And of course, for each member, you can jump into their profile screen. Maybe I clicked on the wrong option here. There it goes. Um, every member has a bio screen where they can, again, control their visibility. There's their basic information. You can control whether these questions are visible or not. The members can have a bio, they might have photo albums. And you can configure um, a lot of these different options. Um, we also do custom directories for a number of organizations that run on Club Express include villages. So, you know, we could actually build a, a fully custom directory uh, for you. And then here are, um, is how you configure a number of the different options that are available. So can members limit the information shown in the directory? And what is the default? Do you want to show birthdays, wedding anniversaries, uh, social networking links? Do you want to show the map? And how do you want to allow people to search in the directory? We have a number of features, I should mention this because it's, it's shown right here. We have a number of features that allow members to express um, you know, interest groups. So there is a, um, an interests module. I don't see it on the menu right now. Um, so let's go here to people. And if I look at interests, um, you can create um, interest categories. So maybe there would be um, a general category on things members like to do. And so it's very easy to customize the details of that. And then we can drill into the individual interests within the categories. And so as a village, you might create these kind of interest groups and allow members to sign up for them. So again, once the pandemic is over, um, many villages will organize trips to the local community orchestra um, or an outdoor concert at, at, in, in the park with uh, the band shell and fireworks. Um, many villages organize movie nights um, and members can express an interest in going. So 
you can create these interest groups um, on whatever categories you want. Members can sign themselves up or you can talk to members and add them. And then when it's time to organize an event, you can actually send out a blast email to all of those members, for example, in the theater group and tell them that, look, we're organizing uh, an upcoming event to see a performance of uh, you know, Fiddler on the Roof um, coming up at the, at the local playhouse and you know, click here if you'd like to sign up and, and join us for that event. So the idea is that we, you know, many of the features that we added for our regular clubs and associations are features that are really useful for villages as well, because it really helps to, to foster a sense of community um, within the village. Next question. Hi, Dan, it's Sam again. Uh, you kind of touched on the next question a little bit when you talked about interests. And the question was, how does the software measure the qualitative aspects of community? Um, feelings of connection to others. And I thought another one of the modules that we could talk about was discussion forums, especially now since people can't necessarily interact with each other in person. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And and I, I will admit that I, I don't know that we have um, an ideal solution right now. Um, you know, we've been talking to a number of our customers, not just villagers, but other customers about how one measures member engagement. Um, you know, is it signing up for events? Is it participation in online discussion forums or downloading the mobile app and participating in chats? Um, there's lots of different ways of measuring engagement and giving, I mean, maybe participating in committees, volunteering, things like that. Um, and every organization will give a different weighting um, to those things. So it, it's something that we've been studying internally. Look, you know, we, we're always working on new features and member engagement is something that, that I think is, is becoming very popular in the, in the association um, community. So it's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, be, you know, beyond that, right now, we have a couple of different ways that you can measure engagement or, or, or satisfaction. Um, one of those, of course, as Sam mentioned, is discussion forums. So we have a very nice discussion forums um, function within, within Run My Village. Uh, let's see if it's here. No, it's not set up there. So if I go to um, communications, I can see forums and let's see what we have here. Um, you can, well, it, it's not very, not very attractive looking, um, but the point is you can create uh, as many forums as you want and you can control the membership of those forums in lots of different ways and encourage members to participate. So that's certainly one thing that you could do. Another thing that you could do is create surveys. We have a very nice um, survey function that's built into Run My Village. Um, so you can create um, surveys. They can be multi-page, multi-question. Uh, the answers can be in about 25 different formats. Um, and then you could publish a survey and then send out a blast email to members saying, hey, we, we're curious about how satisfied you are um, with the village and the services that we provide and the events that we have. So would you mind taking five or 10 minutes, click on this link, it'll take you to the website where you can complete the survey. Um, so that, and then of course you can tally the results and, and uh, you know, review them. Um, we have a number of villages actually that use the surveys function to actually do intake surveys for new members um, <clears throat> and possibly to do annual surveys as well. Um, some villages have talked about, I'm not sure if anyone's actually doing this, but if you want to look at, at measures of a member's independence and cognitive abilities and things like that, um, some villagers have discussed actually having a volunteer meet with the member um, and go through the survey and you know, collect their answers every, you know, annually and you know, just uh, um, um, manage their progress um, you know, through multiple years. So there's a couple of features that we do have built in um, that may um, it may help in that area.
So, yeah. Those were most of the questions we had. We did have a couple of questions about some of the reporting options that we have, especially since some of the reports that we offer are exclusive to villages in the services tab. Okay, so let's have a quick look at reports. I should mention, by the way, that we actually have one of our developers working on redesigning the control panel. Um, this design at this point is a few years old and um, <clears throat> we're not happy with it anymore. Um, a number of our customers are not happy with it. So we're actually in the process of redesigning this control panel and hopefully have that done by uh, well before the end of the year. Um, if I go to services and scroll down to this report section, we have um, almost 50, 60 reports that are available for, um, um, for village services. So when I look at service requests, um, I can look at all of the services that you offer, service requests detailed by category. So for example, let's select that one. I could select all categories. Let's do transportation, click next, all metro areas, um, what, uh, what date range, let's click this year. And then I can click HTML and output the report that way. Um, this report may take a while to run. Let's see what happens. Oh, there it is. Cool. Um, so here's all the transportation requests. Here's our airport trips, our family trips, our medical trips. And you can see the, oh, it's only one page. That's all that's in there right now. Um, so I just close that window and I end up back here. Um, we have reports based on service providers. So all of the different kinds of reports that are available for providers, those that are fully vetted, not fully vetted with expiring vettings. I, I didn't show you the vetting system, but we could look at that if we have time. Um, <clears throat> and then we have um, reports on members who are requesting services. Um, we also have reports on volunteer providers, including time spent. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I didn't show you is that the platform has the ability to collect um, how much time was spent on the service request, what mileage was driven, any costs that were incurred for parking or tolls. And there are ways in which the volunteers can enter that information themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, or that um, uh, someone in the office could collect that information. And many villagers want to you know, be diligent about collecting it because at the end of the year, we give you the ability to run reports, time spent and mileage and expenses um, that you could use if you're applying for grants to local foundations. You know, it's very, very powerful if you're a village and you can go to a local foundation and say, look, over the last 12 months, we've provided 768 services to our members. Um, our volunteers have spent a total of of um, you know 2,300 hours, and you know driven a thousand miles, and and spent all of this money supporting um, seniors within our community. And so, if you collect that sort of information, it's easy to generate those reports at the end of the at the end of each year, or monthly, whatever's appropriate. We also have a number of data exports built in, and with these data exports. Um, we generate a CSV file, um, which you can then open in Excel and manipulate um, any way you want. So there are some very, very detailed and comprehensive exports uh, that are available here. And I should mention, by the way, that not just village services, but every part of the platform, uh, when we click on people, um, you know, there are dozens and dozens of reports related to um, you know, members and non-members. Um, when I click on money, we have lots of reports uh, available on transactions and payments and credits um, that are built in if you're you know, tracking donations, if you're tracking membership signups and renewals. Okay. Sam, anything else? Yes. Uh, could you talk about the village template that we offer? Oh, um, great, thank you uh, for that question. Um, we've actually worked with the um, Run My Village um, users group 
to create a template that preloads a whole bunch of village configuration settings and basically does a, you know, hours and hours worth of setup work for you with, you know, one click of the button in our office. Um, and um, Dick Elkin, who's actually on the call as well, um, was, the, was the one that sort of led that effort and helped to um, set it up. And it's something that we're maintaining on an ongoing basis. Um, but the idea is that if you sign up with Club Express and then you tell us you want the template, um, we can press you know, one button in our office and we'll then preload and configure a whole bunch of stuff for you in terms of um, not just the village um, services, but also menus and the look and feel and member types um, and categories, um, committees, interest groups, uh, um, you know, photo albums, just tons and tons of stuff that gets set up for you. And then you can review it um, and you can say, well, you know, I don't want this, I want this instead, and certainly make any changes you need. But the idea is to give new villagers, <clears throat> starting out with Run My Village, just a head start and a, a running jump um, to get things set up and, uh, um, you know, to move forward with the platform. I think we're basically out of time. So again, I wanted to thank everyone who um, stayed. I know it's the end of the day. And from what I've seen, I've listened to a number of sessions, but from what I've seen, it's really been a very exciting start to this virtual conference. And so I wanted to thank all of you for hanging around to the end and for, for listening to what we had to offer. Um, you know, again, we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have or to schedule um, demos of the Run My Village um, platform. Um, my email address is dan at clubexpress.com. Um, so if, if anybody, you know, has direct questions, um, you know, feel free to send them to me or as I said, um, call. And, um, you know, I wish everybody um, a, a successful, you know, rest of the conference and obviously thank uh, Steve and uh, Barbara, Dick Elkin, Sam as well, uh, for helping to put all of this together and, and you know, monitoring the session.